Well, dear Susanne Böttger, dear Astrid Weiss, ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Christiane Wendehorst. I'm president of the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences at this Academy of Sciences. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to open tonight's at Hedy Lamar Lecture, which is organized as part of the Academy Lectures at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So the ORV named lectures have the aim of inviting really top class international scientists from different subject areas. And with these lectures, the Academy wants to inspire the interested public uh, with regard to the latest research findings and raise awareness of current scientific and social science as challenges. And most recently, as some of you may know, because I see some faces which um, um, I already know, um, uh, uh, Academy lectures have been given by the physicist and Nobel Prize laureate Duncan Haldane, sociologist Stefan Mao, and environmental researcher Kai Helfricht. But now to today's Hedy Lamar lecture. Um, Building on the initial idea of our Institute for Comparative Media and Communication Studies, the CMC, which I had the pleasure actually to visit only this afternoon and learn about all the most recent research endeavors, the Hedy Lamar lectures are dedicated to the effects of new technologies and society. The lecture is named after the Austrian-American actress and inventor Hedy Lamar, 1914 to 2000, who developed the idea of frequency hopping, so Frequenzsprungverfahren, that forms the basis of today's mobile communications technology. And in honor of her achievements, the telescope up on the roof of the ÖRW Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information is named after Hedy Lamar. Previous Hedy Lamar lectures have been held by René Meyerhofer, University of Linz, and Silke Weinfurtner, University of Oxford. And I'm very, very pleased that we were able to secure you, uh, Professor Böttger, as a prominent speaker uh, in this series for tonight. I'm very much looking forward to an enjoyable evening, a wonderful lecture, I'm really sure about. And I would like to take this opportunity already now to invite all of you to a reception on the ground floor after the talk. And I hope that then we will have the opportunity to um, extend our discussions, which I'm sure we will have. But um, for the introduction of our renowned speaker tonight and for an introduction to the topic, I would now like to ask my dear colleague from the Academy, um, Astrid Weiss, uh, to take over. Astrid, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you so much again, Professor Böttger, for coming and, and holding this lectures. Astrid, please. Thank you, Christiane, for the introduction words. Um, my name is Astrid Weiss. I'm a member of the Young Academy, of the Academy of Sciences. And the Hedy Lamar lecture, as mentioned, is a series of lectures. And we get asked as members of the Academy every year, is there anyone you want to nominate? And for this time of the nomination, I went back with that question to our research group at TU Wien on human-computer interaction, I was like, who do we really want to fly in? Who do we really want to get the opportunity to meet in person? And that was you, Susanne. Um, and the thing is, when I started human-computer interaction research 15 years ago, I was a sociologist. Um, and I started reading about how people do user research in this interdisciplinary field. And several times I read your name and I read several papers of you, and I thought like, as a sociologist, mm, is there ever a chance to meet her in person? And who could have expected that at some day I will even be here introducing you um, for a talk? So I could explain you now all these 
criteria and measures of excellence, but you can also trust the academy that we only invite people who are considered really excellent. But I could throw in some numbers like 18,000 citations. I googled that today. Uh, age index for, uh, 53, so all the criteria um, apply to you being an excellent researcher when it comes to these measurements. Um, but what was the most excellent um, excellent criterion for me personally was when I first stumbled across your project Utopia. I'm not sure if you will mention it today, but that was my introduction to this whole idea of participatory design and how to involve people in technology development. So I think it will be mentioned one way or the other today um, in your talk on contemporary human computer interaction. And I see some of the students and some members of the group um, in the audience today. So I'm pretty sure we will get some interesting questions afterwards as well. But the rest of introduction is up to you to introduce yourself. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, I've never been in the silent movies, but I suppose we, I can do a Hedy Lamar lecture nonetheless. Um, I chose to talk about how we understand tools and why that's important to contemporary human-computer interaction. Quite obviously, there, there could have been quite a number of other topics that I could have picked, but, but this is now it for today. I want to say that, that I've had um, an ERC advance grant for the past five years. It's just ending, and a lot of the research that I'll talk about today is, uh, is based on that. I just wanted to keep an eye on the clock, and that I realized I can't do that here. But anyway, that's fine. Uh, so here I am. I am a computer scientist by training and, and occupation, basically. So I've always worked in this rather interdisciplinary area, area of human-computer interaction. Um, I had, as it happens, I've spent 40 years at Aarhus University this August, so I've really been there for quite a long time. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I think is something you can discuss, definitely. I'm not sure it would have been appreciated if I was to apply for a new job today. Anyway, um, I've done research in theory and method of human-computer interaction, computer-supported collaborative work, uh, and participatory design. I've also, also been a member of the so-called ACM Chi Academy for quite a number of years, and the Danish Academy of, of Science and, Sciences and Letters, I suppose it's called. Basically, I'm interested, I'm always puzzled, I'm always curious of uh, what happens when people are using technologies in unexpected ways. So I have this uh, picture, I've actually borrowed it from my colleague Ole Sayer just because some of you know him. So this is a picture of a couple of kids in a Danish school. I don't know if you can see what they're doing, but basically on the smart board in their class, they put up some really big post-it notes. And what they're discussing on those post-it notes are showing are Danish cities, basically. So what, what, what always puzzles me and what interests me is how come in a school class, maybe five years ago, in, in Denmark, we have children using the smart board as a background for putting up post-it notes and discussing uh, Danish cities on paper. So, so I'm curious about this at any number of levels, like this little guy also who decided that, that uh, they would use the smart board in this way, who decided that the smart board got put in place in the school instead perhaps of a 
regular whiteboard or blackboard or just a pinboard that they could put these things on, and, and so on and so forth. So, basically, I'm, I'm very interested in thinking about how, how we can understand use and also the, the adaptation, you can say, of technology to various use contexts. Why is it that we use technologies the way we do? How had, has it come to be that way? What are the decision processes behind use in this? How was the technology designed? What was it intended for? I'm pretty sure that smart boards were not intended for putting up uh, post-it notes, right? But, <laughs> but then again, what, what, what was it intended for? How could alternatives pro be provided? And with alternatives, I, I'm thinking actually both processes and products. What, how could these adaptation introduction processes have been different in, in the school class specifically? But also, what other kinds of technologies could one have thought of or wanted in, in the school class? On this, um, in my, my ESC project, we worked for the past five years, but, but this goes way longer than that, on, on thinking about what, what are the appropriate theoretical concepts for for thinking about technology, and not just, cons I mean, even though human-computer interaction is a, an interdisciplinary approach, not just concepts that comes from the outside, but also concepts that come, in a way, from within the area. And I got reminded, I would say, that, that uh, Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores, who wrote a book in 1986 to be critical of AI. I think we can maybe even remind ourselves that that was the case. There was actually a strong AI criticism in, in the 1980s. They talk about tools. They talk about how tools are fundamental to action, and through our actions, we generate the world. The transformation we are concerned with they talk about. It's not only a technical one, but a continuing evolution of how we understand our surroundings and ourselves, how we continue becoming the beings that we are. And I actually think that, that this business of becoming, becoming with technology is interesting. It's not about, you know, is, is a particular use of technology good or bad? It's actually how is that shaping us, and how are we shaping the technology? I put the, the triangle in up there because my own quite many years have I've uh, used theories from uh, activity theory where it's also a strong part of, of the theoretical thinking that whatever we do as human beings is mediated. And you can say tools are mediators of our our world or our activity. I mean, quite specifically, I'm using both this clicker and, and PowerPoint for this presentation, but surely without being able to speak with you in some form of semi-natural language, being this academic English that none of us are, sorry, maybe one or two are native to, um, is, is part of that. So that's, that's in my work, mediation. Uh, Pelin and Morten Kung also way back wrote about uh, tools as a way of thinking about how technology can, instead of supporting automation, can, be, can focus on quality of process and product. I also took this picture, brought this picture along of, uh, from Michel Bodanglet Fong's paper from 2000, where he goes into more details about how specifically it is that what he calls an instrument, which I think is kind of what I call the tool here, uh, is, is situated in between human users and their domain objects. For instance, in, in this particular instance, we have a mouse, we have a scroll bar, and someone uh, mediating or standing between the user and the document that she seems to be
be working on. So when I talk about tools in this context, it's in contrast, I would say, to automation. It doesn't mean that we don't automate things with, with uh, technology when, when we talk about them as, as uh, tools, but, but it means that our focus and attention is slightly different. Um, it's also tools in contrast to what human-computer interaction has traditionally been doing, namely trying to model uh, human cognition. And it's also, and I want to just mention again, maybe tools in contrast to artificial intelligence, to the understanding of technology as these autonomous agents that are out there independent on us, of us. So, in my work and in what I've worked with over the years, it's, it's be, been quite important to think about human beings as active, acting subjects and not study objects. So, I think it's, we, we would often stress that, the, and it's also not about human beings being alone, an individual, and one user at the time. It's actually about human beings doing activities together in organized manners, in skillful and resourceful ways. We also think of a lot of this as happening in organizations, and I don't want to go into that, but I think organizations are more than just work context, and they're more than NGOs, but just the way human activity is organized is characterized by conflicts of interest and, and also of uh, imbalance of resources. And the last thing that, that kind of also comes out of this is that we need to understand use as in real use happening out there. The, the boys using the smart board in, in a school class and not as something that can be studied uh, and, and seen in isolation in a lab. Uh, so we often talk about empowering people because, because it's, I think it's a natural consequence, of course, of the participatory design upbringing, but also of thinking of people as being resourceful and skillful. So, so empowering of people is something that, that's central both in terms of empowering individuals, but also parts of, as part of their groups, their organizational units, their communities, what have you. Empowering of people is important. So yes, people are resourceful experts in their own joint practices. They make choices, they organize, they act. And, and we need to embrace that. But I also think that, that it's very important when you have that kind of uh, change perspective on, on both people, but also maybe on theoretical concepts, that we think about how can we then use uh, such concepts as tools, uh, in a way, as a theory. And I think so. so I've written quite a bit with uh, Michel Vaudrin Lafong and Wendy Mackay about this recently. To think about how we can investigate use situations such as the one with the, with the boys in, in the class, but also how we can be critical towards some of that, but also how we can build alternatives. So generally to say that we, we want the theories to be both analytical, critical, and constructive. Uh, and then, as I was hinting at when I was reading the quote from Winograd and Flores, it's not only about understanding things as they are, it's actually also about understanding things as they're becoming. So we want to understand, in a way, both the history, the current situation, and the future possibilities and use our theoretical concepts such as tools for that. So, what has happened regarding tools since 
the Winograden floors quote from 86 of since uh, uh, the Ian and Kung uh, quote or citation from also 84, 85. How can we then understand tools today and what are the challenges we're, we're facing here? Now, first of all, I, I, I emphasize often that, you know, it's about collaboration and community. I actually like this, this uh, figure or this, this picture of a set of tradi traditional craft people who are together building a staircase. I mean, there's a lot of organization in this whereby actually the actual staircase allow them to work with different tools at different parts at the same time. I think they are also probably a result of... Now, I'm not an expert of sort of uh, classical craftsmanship. I don't think they, they have the same set of qualifications. I think they, they are quite different here. And uh, so I think it's important to understand that the tools are always happening or being used as part of collaboration and as part of community. The kind of challenges we have these days is that obviously when we talk about the, the technologies that we are all surrounding ourselves with, they come in many different forms. So we use PowerPoint or Word or email on many different platforms and on different screens, you can say not only that, but sometimes also without a screen. So, so it's also important to understand what, what those multiplicities kind of mean and where we bring in our community, where we bring in our collaboration in this, this multifaceted situation. I think it's also important to think about how when we talk about tools, we talk often thinking of, of craft in a traditional sense, so we have materials, but, but I want to emphasize that the communication side of, of this is just as important. But also that, that one of the things I think that technology does to us, which makes it even more important to understand this, is that the technology also and the, and the tools we use also shift between when things are material and when they are about communication. So, so basically, I borrowed this picture from uh, Nacho Avellino and colleagues from Sabon who have studied how surgeons use a surgical robot. So basically, in the classical setup, you know, the surgeon was standing at the patient, looking at the patient and getting tools surgical instruments and, and so on. But with, the, uh, with these robots, what's actually happening is that the surgeons are put over in the corner. So they're sitting, navy operating the, uh, the robots, but they're actually facing away from the patient, as in this case. So they have to, you have to have these, uh, they have to rely, I would say, on the communication with their bedside assistants for being 100% sure that the robot is actually doing the right things. So, so I think there's a big shift in this particular context from a situation where you got the, uh, where you got the surgeon actually having his or her hands basically on the patient or even inside the patient to this situation where while the, the surgeon is navigating this robot, he's not actually seeing and feeling and, and so on what's happening, and he's relying on the communication with, with uh, somebody. I mean, surely a skilled person and all of that, but it's still not, not hands on the material. We worked uh, in thinking about these multiplicities and multitudes quite a lot with the idea of artifact ecologies as something that, that uh, we find a useful concept. So instead of thinking about one artifact or one tool uh, at the time, we want to embrace, in a way, all, all the technologies that this particular community 
is using, could use, should use on the objects that they share. So, so artifact ecologies is one, one thing we've written about. We've also talked about collective uh, artifact ecologies as something even maybe more specific or more focused on what a collective or also in some instances a community. I don't have the time to go into the distinction between those two. We wrote a long paper about that recently. But, but, but the fact that you have a community or you have a collective and together they do, they do do all these things with these multiple technologies. And that's, in a way, the start, starting point analytically and also when it comes to thinking about how the technologies could be built differently. There are other elements of uh, what happens with tools in our current situation, whereas traditional craft tools are maybe pretty stable over time. I think there's, in our current settings, a lot of dynamics, a lot of development, a lot of ways in which uh, things are changing. And with Clement Clock, who is a colleague of mine, I, I wrote uh, a paper some years ago where we're trying to think about what happens when a new tool gets introduced into an existing artifact ecology. First, I mean, we would say, and this is obviously rather simplistic, you have this unsatisfactory state. There's a reason why this new tool gets relevant or gets, it gets possible to, well, it gets desired, you can say, uh, by, by the users. Then what happens is that once you get the new tool on board, there's a kind of a situation where um, there's some sort of deliberation with the, to the tool set that's already there. And in some instances, so, so one of the things we were talking about in, in the particular case was introducing a new smartphone in, into sort of a personal artifact ecology. And quite obviously what happened, I don't know, we, some of us are old enough that we can remember when we started to have smartphones, right? So uh, people stopped using music players. People stopped using cameras, except maybe for the professional photographer who wants to actually take good pictures. But I think for most of us, we are only nowadays we are mainly using our, our, our phones for that. So there's this excited state as we talk about it, or this maybe a slightly turbulent state where there's kind of a battle between the technologies. Then, after a while, we reach a stable state where maybe the technologies aren't changed a lot uh, for a very long time until then something else happens, whether it's because we need to, need to change or because, because we somehow want, want to change to a new situation, and, and, and then this whole thing repeats. So, I, so there's a lot in how this form of development happens. It's about the breakdowns in the current uses and the way we're then appropriating the technology along the way. Um, and I think there's something fundamental in the way we then develop tools, develop these technologies. Uh, I, many years ago, I was reading uh, a book by Uri Engström, and he has this idea that, that we have these change, these development processes, but we're never ending where we were intending to when we started, right? So there's always, we have a, a need state, we kind, of, we kind of know that something needs to change, and then we go through all the steps, and when we're sort of shooting a little bit beside where we started, and that, he's arguing, is kind of the dynamics and the reason why the whole, the whole development process then carries on. 
And, and obviously, we, there can be many reasons why we're not really hitting where we thought we were going, and the world is changing. And I mean, all of those people who are used to doing de designing, developing commercial uh, IT products of various kinds know that organizations change, and even though they think they found the solution to what the company wanted, then the company doesn't want exactly that anymore. So I think that there's sort of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, reasons for that. You can also say, I mean, uh, the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard said that the world had to be lived forward and experienced backwards. There's definitely this whole tension between the expectations that we have and the, and the experiences we're bringing, and it's not, just a simple step from one to the other. Um, Victor Kaptelinen and Liam Bannon in 2012 wrote a paper about what they talk about as practice transformation. So practice transformation is the adaptation and also the more overall development processes that, that we are facing with technology. And they try to make the point that some of those developments come from the inside and others come from the outside. And I think, uh, the, for instance, you know, today, I, I talked, I don't know, I got into a situation earlier today with the people I talked about where, where we talk about these uh, European Union procurement rules for, for when, you, when you get technology into an organization, right? And quite basically, you have these rules that are really external. It doesn't, if you're working in a university, it doesn't matter whether you like the teaching support system you have or not, because every so many years, there has to be a new tender out there, and so you're, you're bound to get somebody else in, right? So it changes. Or you can say, well, you know, um, Microsoft Words change their the way something is done uh, in ways that you didn't really want them to, but, but, but you have to kind of live with it. And, and I think and that's what, what Kapsalin and Bannon would say is that that is different from the kind of changes you, that come from the inside of the, the classroom, of the uh, work situation, of the, of the community, and so on. So, so there's that. Uh, so I want to talk about a project that, that was, has been with us, I would say, for, for a while as part of my ESC project. It started, and it is fundamentally uh, based in uh, Ida Larsen Lid's PhD project. She is no longer in Aarhus, she is now with Microsoft, but but we actually still keep analyzing and publishing on those data. So she was uh, interested in collaborative writing. And uh, what she did was, to be slightly uh, nosy or critical to a lot of HCI, she did not start with getting a random group of people together and asking them how they collaborate when they're writing. She actually went out and did a long time, long term investigation of how groups of people were collaborating when they were writing specific things. So sci scientists who were writing a paper together uh, in, in, in the Danish context, we have uh, groups of students do master theses together. So those are, so she got all their she got access to all their, uh, their documents, to the versions of the documents, uh, whether they had been writing in Google Docs or in, in Overleaf, what have you. Uh, and she interviewed them on several occasions during the process. And also, it ended up with a, a participatory design uh, project or process to think about the future. I'll get back to that in a little while. But first of all, uh, along the way, she, she, we did, and she did quite a lot of analysis 
of what what the what the tools and what the, the technology was doing to people when they were doing collaborative writing. And I think probably all of you here have, have used things like Google Docs, right? So you, you kind of also know that, that uh, it can be very annoying to see that you got somebody who's also in the document at the same time as you are. Uh, so, but obviously, there are many different ways of sharing, uh, doing collaborative writing. So some of the cases she had was also, you had two students doing a master's thesis or PhD, and, and then you had the supervisor com coming in to do commenting and so on. Uh, we actually work quite a bit with uh, visualizing, and th this is kind of what you can see down here in the corner. Um, the activities of collaborative writing, and it's interesting that you can actually get access through to this data in Google Docs, but they have, I, to my knowledge, not done anything with it. But basically, what you see here is a document, and you can kind of see what blocks of text this, this was constituted of, and then you can see you know, who, who has worked on which parts. So you can see that whoever the blue guy is, he or she has done most. And, and for most parts, apparently in rather big chunks and rather uncontroversial chunks, right? But then you also see that there are some parts that, that are more fragmented and that you know, have been done differently. You also see Green coming in and offering larger chunks of something in particular instances. And then in this more choppy part there, you also see Yellow has just changed a very few things, but maybe in very central, central uh, parts. Are you saying this is a supervisor? Yes, that's your guess, but yeah. Probably, I would say, I don't know <laughs> either <laughs> specifically, right? Uh, but, but this is one example. We also, when we started thinking about this, we also talked about using some of the, the, the tool thinking and, and the way of thinking about tools that we developed in, in, in the project. How, for instance, traces could be something that would be useful for people who are doing collaborative writing. So with, with, with traces in this context, we also compared it with other cases about something else, but now I'll just stay with the, uh, with the collaborative writing part. Um, you know, th seeing, for instance, following what a particular person has done on this document, or what let's say a particular discussion led to uh, could also be, be an example of, of traces. So, so we were using the, the idea of traces both analytically, but also uh, critically to scrutinize whether the technologies we have available would, would work for traces and then also constructively. So we tried to think about what, what it would mean to build a trace tool, you can say, into, into some of these platforms. We also, now I'll seriously look at the clock because this, see if I can get this going. We, we also, as I was saying, we did, uh, well, or Ida and, and my other PhD student, Marcel, to be fair, did a workshop series with some of these people that either had interviewed and worked with. So it's a, it's a good example, actually, of a more long-term sort of study, uh, where they were also invited to some participatory design uh, activities. And as part of that, also, uh, be, they were offered to try to built their own collaborative writing tools in an open and malleable platform that we have available, that we use in Aarhus called Webstraits. 
So basically, what I have here, and we, it's, it's a little bit long and, and, and silent movie, uh, is, is uh, an example of how a particular pair of people who were participating in, in, in these workshops were trying to develop their, their own uh, collaborative editor. Specifically, these are two uh, university teachers, and they are thinking very much on how to develop this for use also with their students. I'll just try to see if I can get this working. Mm -hmm. It's working. So we have Lisa and Mike, and, and they are starting to work on this project. So first of all, they're adding stuff. They're putting in some, you know, we, we learned over the years that building a prototype with no contents isn't working well. So this is the first thing they do. They uh, decide how, how you could uh, you put, put, put text into this collaborative editor that they're building. It may take a little bit longer than we wish for here. But the thing is that this is then done in this web streets platform. So basically, everything can be changed. Everything is malleable and open. And then they go on that they really want a tool to, to do maybe what we were just talking about, namely to follow how many changes and who is changing this. And, and uh, then they install this edit tool, and uh, that is then intended to help them uh, monitor who, who is working on what. The thing is that, that the current tool isn't working quite like that, so it's just giving them, say here, 119 edits that had happened in this. So that doesn't really help them find out who, who is doing what. So they go in and they, they work on this uh, and using this tool, and this is maybe a slightly long story, but, but they go in and the, they can actually, in, in the process, change the code for this particular button that they created. And so they do that, and they come up with a, a different button that can now tell them who has done what in this document. Then you don't have to guess who was the, uh, who was the supervisor. Uh, they, yeah, that has to be quite obviously kind of brought, brought into the uh, the technology and reload it because this is a web-based system. But lo and behold, they get to a point where you can now see that Lisa did 72 edits and, and Mike did 47. Uh, they decide they want two more tools that they add, and one is basic. They can basically, because these they have a tool set here that they can choose from, they choose one to uh, as an inspirational prompt, and they also choose one that locks the paragraph so that you can work in, a, in quietness without other people noticing. So first is the inspirational uh, prompt, so it now has a button, and, and what happens when, when you do that is just that you get some phrases that you can use in the document. And this may not be the most interesting thing, but the other thing is, since people are often complaining that they don't like this business of pe somebody looking over their shoulder while, while they are uh, working on a paragraph, they can now, they now introduce this very, you know, the paragraph gets locked looking at the uh, collaborator's text, but it's also totally blurred. And uh, they find out that maybe this is not the, the best thing, and so they, they modify the tool to make it not blurred, but something else, namely a brownish locked thing, so that, that they can actually, you can see that somebody, it's locked and somebody else is working on it, but it doesn't disappear uh, totally, and uh, we'll see that. Uh, how that looks once they then relaunch it. So 
now you can see that, that uh, while the one person can write, the other person can't touch it. So the next step for this, and this is basically where the uh, video ends, is then now they have this new tool, and they could, could go and experiment with it with their students. Now, quite obviously, this is not a participatory design project or process for anybody, right? Because these university teachers had some level of programming skills that, that was needed for this particular instance and wouldn't work for all kinds of contexts. But nonetheless, uh, this is to say that, that the idea also of thinking about this as tools and also as tools in, in the design process where you actually have a toolbox that you can use, choose from and you can adopt the tools into your context is part of the way we're thinking about these things. Oops. So, so I think this is kind of getting me back to why bother with tools and with theories and with theory work in the first place in human-computer interaction. Um, and I think, for me, having a theory or using a theory is, is not that far from developing a theory. So, so just like with the tools, this is, this is actually something we do all the time. So I've had quite a few discussions lately with Henrik, who is here coincidentally on the, on, the, on the picture about doing theory work or how, how, to, how to approach that in the first place. But I think what we've, what we've achieved so far is really that, that we, have, we are using the concept of tools to discuss how, what, you know, how people are helped or hindered when they do uh, their collective activities and use tools on, on the world around them with other people. Uh, we also think that the tools is a useful concept when we think about human practice and, and how development happens. And then again, we think that what we need to hold on to and what, what tools, and I think, I mean, at least I've been trying to show that, that, that this is how the tool concept can also be used. It's important to have theory that can be used both analytically, critically, and constructively. And with that, I, I mean, I also think that, that you know, when, when, you, when you want to be critical and when you want to also work constructively, it is actually important to think about and, and involve the, the users at all levels. So I think there's also a challenge, I think, for, for participatory design or for working with users in having this being informed by theory, having theory being involved in all of this. So I also ask on the first slide this, you know, why is this important to, there's a typo here, but anyway, to import to HCI research. I think we, we, we do need theory. We need theorizing that is not just importing from other disciplines. Uh, and as I said, and now it's becoming a bit repetitive, we need to be able to use these theories analytically, critically, and constructively. And we need also to engage with use and users. And I think that, that is also a very important part of how we need to develop HCI re research, because we, we don't, I think, as much as we could in, in human-computer interaction, even though it feels a bit self-contradictory. I just want to end with saying that, that a lot of this argumentation around tools and multiple technologies, artifact ecologies, and infrastructure is also something that, that we've written about in this 
fairly recent book that is called Participatory Design. It also talks about collaboration and use over time and new design methods. And I mean, I, I deliberately call it here PD Our Way because I think there are many ways of telling the story of what participatory design is these days. And uh, we have one take of this, but it's surely not the one and only and the right way of, of talking about this or doing it. But, but if you're interested, you know, go find it. It's, uh, I think a lot of libraries, have, since it's one of these synthesis lectures on human-centered informatics, a lot of university libraries actually has, has access to, to it, so you can find it. So I think this is basically what I plan to say today and, and do, so thanks for having me and uh, whatever, whatever comes next from here. <laughs>